Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you're new here I hope you're all doing so well welcome back to another true crime and makeup video today we are doing the case of John Wayne Gacy if you've been here for a while you will know that was the very first true crime video I ever done but looking back at it now I just feel like there was some information missing that I wish I'd included so I've decided to go back and redo it it is a longer one than usual so make sure you're comfy cozy definitely grab a drink go to the toilet before you start this video. This is a really hard hitting case. It is about the tragic loss of, I mean, we're saying 33 young boys, but it really could be more than that. Um, I know it will be a heavy one. I've been as undescriptive as possible of it, about individual deaths, because um, I know it's hard to hear, but I hope I've gave enough information that it's interesting and that you walk away knowing something new. All the details for the products that I've used on my face today will be down below as well the links to my social media. I would love if you could leave case suggestions either in the comments or email them across to me at my email up on the screen now as usual. But I really do hope you enjoy this and it would mean the world if you could like, comment and subscribe. Please tell any family or friends that enjoy true crime videos to come and subscribe to me. It would mean the world to me. Also, I just want to say this is true crime and makeup. The reason that I do makeup is I find it very, very therapeutic. It's something that can distract me whilst I'm telling these stories. I'm not doing it to be insensitive in any way, shape or form. It's just I need something to focus on when I'm talking about these things that happen to people. So yeah, that's why we do true crime and makeup. It's all about doing a bit of therapy whilst we go through these horrific cases. <sighs> Let's get on in the true crime case, shall we? This is a, this is a tough one. So John Wayne Gacy was born on St. Patrick's Day. So the 17th of March, 1942. And he was born in Chicago, Illinois to John Stanley Gacy and also Marion Elaine Gacy. And he was the middle child out of three children. So he had a younger sister and an older sister. And it's said that his dad did name him after John Wayne. You know, like the I think it's like the old cowboy kind of films like your dad or your granddad might know them I think they were like very very popular I mean I know the name John Wayne and I've never watched an old western so and John Wayne Gacy's dad was an auto repair machinist and he was also a World War One veteran and he did seem to really struggle with alcoholism and also his rage. It was said by John Wayne Gacy that his dad would actually beat him and both of his sisters with a razor strap. Like if he thought they were misbehaving and with a razor strap he would go. Gacy's dad would also call him like a sissy, a pansy and basically compare him to his sisters making out that he wasn't a tough guy and John Stanley Gacy was very much like a in his mind like a macho man like although you're bullying children so how much a macho man are you really but that's kind of the vibe that he gave off. So it is said that for Gacy his kind of like psychosexual history all began between the ages of six and ten and the very first time it was actually one of his mother's friends daughters who undressed Gacy and basically started to play with him. And then in 1949 so what age would that be? Gacy would be seven, I think. Gacy's dad actually went ahead and whipped him, like severely whipped him, because he had found out that Gacy and one of his friends had been fondling a young girl. And from what I could make out, this girl was even younger than them. So even though they're young, she was even younger. In that very same year, so remember Gacy's seven at this point, that very same year, a family friend of the Gacy's molested Gacy multiple times whenever he was left alone with him and John Wayne Gacy felt that he couldn't go to his father and tell him this because the way his father's treated him, calling, calling him a sissy, calling him a girl, John Wayne Gacy thought his father would just blame him and that this would be something that was his fault again so he had to keep it to himself. Gacy also had a really really turbulent relationship with his dad like whatever he did 
was never ever going to be good enough for his dad and he really really struggled with this I think he just really wanted to please him and feel like he was enough and that his dad was actually proud of him and Gacy did suffer from a congenital heart condition so this did mean that he was pretty much alienated from children his age because they would all be playing sports or doing sports at school John couldn't take part in any of this because of his heart condition so he was kind of like an overweight child and people never really wanted much to do with him and allegedly according to Gacy his dad seen this as like yet another failing like yet another thing his son couldn't do that was like a manly thing and Gacy would really struggle with really frequent seizures, he would black out all the time and it is actually said that between the ages of 14 and 18, Gacy would have spent up to almost a year in hospital and in 1957 he was hospitalised with a burst appendix. Would you believe it that when Gacy was in hospital one of these times, after a seizure or a blackout, his dad accused him of faking his illness. So in 1960 when John was 18 years old is when he really started to get involved with politics and he ended up working as an assistant precinct captain for a Democratic Party candidate and even though his son was getting involved in politics and trying to do something good this still resulted in Gacy's dad referring to him as a patsy and a sissy. And the same year that Gacy started working within politics, his dad actually purchased him a car. And I know what you're thinking, what a really nice thing to do. Like, that's a step in the right direction for amending this relationship. Um, no, it wasn't, because with the car, he bought it for Gacy, but he kept it in his own name. And he was doing this until Gacy could pay it off himself. So any time that he felt Gacy was misbehaving or not acting the way he would want him to act, he would just confiscate the keys so Gacy no longer had access to the car. In 1962, Gacy went out and purchased himself a set of spare keys so his dad could no longer confiscate them and take them away from him. And when Gacy's dad found out that he had done this, he was not happy. That, like, this man not getting to have a wee bit of control, not happy. So he removed the distributor cap from the car and then he did end up just replacing it three days later. But as soon as he did that, John was like, I'm out here. Like, I, I cannot live like this anymore. So he hopped in the car and drove to Las Vegas, Nevada. John was hoping like moving across to Nevada that he would be able to live with his cousin and I mean he was in desperate need of a place to stay because he only had $136 on him when he made this move. Not the best thought out plan but I see the vision. And once Gacy was in Las Vegas he did work with the Las Vegas Ambulance Service and then he was transferred over to Pam Mortuary to be a mortuary assistant so he would basically observe the morticians, he would watch the bodies being embalmed, he would assist on this and a cot was actually set up for Gacy behind the embalming room so Gacy would sleep there throughout the night and he did say himself that he used to climb into the coffins with the deceased bodies and this one particular night he climbs into a coffin that has the body of a young boy in it and he actually starts caressing the young boy's body and like snuggling in with it and he said himself that this really shocked him like he was really taken aback by what he had done and he ended up phoning his mum because he was so distraught about what he had done and had asked if he would be able to move back home and if their dad well if his dad would be okay with him moving back into the family home I mean obviously his mum said yes don't know how thrilled the dad was but then again he was maybe happy to have Gacy back under his roof under his control. So although Gacy never completed high school, when he got home from Nevada, he did enrol and graduate from Northwestern Business College in Chicago in 1963. After that, he went for a position in a shoe shop. It was like Nunbush, Nimbush shoe shop. And then he was transferred over to Springfield, Illinois, where he would become a salesman. And then he was eventually promoted into a management position as well. And people do say Gacy was a very, very good businessman, despite how much we hate and despise this man. He was strong in business. In March of that year, so March of 1964, Gacy ended up getting engaged to one of his colleagues, Marilyn Myers. 
yep, this man, this animal has bagged himself a wife somehow. Doesn't make sense to me. And during this time, Gacy did join the local chapter JCs. So the JCs basically focused on leadership and business development through acts of like social services. And it would be this same year that Gacy would experience his second homosexual experience. So for this experience, Gacy had said that another JC colleague had plied him with loads of alcohol and then basically said to Gacy like, oh, you know, don't worry about getting home. You can spend the night on my couch, like just sleep over. It's fine. And when Gacy was very, very, very drunk, apparently this colleague started performing oral sex on Gacy and he never really spoke much else about this. I don't know if it was like reciprocated, but as we go through this horrific story and case of Gacy, it's unlikely that he would just sit back and let it happen. In 1965, Gacy became the vice president of the Springfield JCs and he was nominated for third outstanding JC throughout Illinois. Now, he thought this was pretty amazing, but if you listen to Abby Lee Miller, second's the first to lose, so being third, not too good. So Gacy went on to marry Marilyn in September of 1964. Now, her dad was quite the businessman himself, and he ended up buying into three KFC restaurants. So he basically purchased them, they were his own, and he needed somebody to run these restaurants, and he thought, who better than John Gacy? Who's going to be better than John Wayne Gacy himself? So he asked John Wayne Gacy if he would manage the three restaurants and basically gave a very lucrative offer that I'm not even sure I could turn down. The three restaurants were in Waterloo, Iowa. So Marilyn and Gacy could basically move to Waterloo, Iowa and they would live in Marilyn's parents' former house and it was said that Gacy would bring in like around 15k a year which in this day and age is about 124,000 which listen that that's some good money and he was also going to get a share of the restaurant profits so yeah kind of a no-brainer to be honest, I think, I think I'd be right there in Waterloo, Iowa. I'd be like, hi, welcome home. So in the basement of this house, Gacy went ahead and opened up what he referred to as the club. And this was basically for the employees of the KFC restaurants that he worked with. They could come back, they could all have like a drink and he would ply them with drink. He would offer them drugs. Now, there was actually male and female colleagues within these KFC restaurants, but Gacy only ever invited over the males, the young male boys that worked in the restaurant. And when he got them drunk enough and drugged up enough I suppose he would make sexual advances towards these young boys and if the advances were like rejected or they were a bit like oh my god like what are you doing Gacy would then turn around and be like oh it's just a joke or he would say that he was testing their morals to make sure that you know they were straight not what he was doing at all he was hoping for a good time in February 1966, Gacy's wife Marilyn gave birth to their son and then in March 1967, Marilyn gave birth to their daughter and it was around this time where Gacy finally got the approval of his dad. Um, his dad actually shook his hand and stated, I was wrong about you, son. This was all Gacy had waited for like his entire life. He's always felt like he could never get his father father's approval, like he was never good enough, like he wasn't the man that his father wanted him to be. And now he's finally like, oh my God, like I am finally getting the approval of this man that I idolise. Like at this point, Gacy's kind of on cloud nine. He's like, yay, my father loves me. My father is proud of me. So in Waterloo, Gacy was working like 12 to 14 hour shifts in these KFC restaurants. Like obviously they were so busy, but he was also joining the JCs in Waterloo. And on top of his 12 to 14 hour shifts, he was also offering extended hours to the JCs. Like just being this good upstanding citizen that just wants to help. And every time he attended the JC meetings, he would bring like big buckets of KFC for the other JC colleagues and he would make them call him Colonel. 
Like, what in the sexual fantasy is going on there? I know it's like the Colonel, the KFC Colonel, but like, no. That's like the equivalent of call me daddy, I'm sorry. Call me Colonel. Now, these JCs, you'd think like, oh, upstanding citizens just want to help the community and do all this great stuff. Well, they were actually heavily involved in drug abuse, pornography, prostitution, even wife swapping. Like, and to me, wife swapping, I believe, is when like they would have sex with each other's wives. Pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong. Just doing like the math there, I, th I think that's what it's what it is. And I have to say, everyone in the JCs thought really highly of Gacy. They thought he was this really ambitious, successful man. And in 1967, he was named Outstanding Vice President of the Waterloo JCs. In 1967, Gacy assaulted a 15-year-old boy by the name of Donald Voorhees. Now, he was actually the son of one of the fellow JC members, Donald Edwin Voorhees. So Gacy had lured young Voorhees to his house saying that, you know, we're gonna drink, I'll let you watch the porn that we watch at the JC meetings. Like, the guys really used to watch porn together. Do they still do this? To me, that's very strange. Why would you watch porn together, like, with a friend? But anyway, so th this is what he's doing. He's luring poor Donald Voorhees to his house, saying, we'll drink, we'll watch porn together, we're going to have a real good time. Then when Gacy felt that young Donald was drunk enough and vulnerable enough, he then asked if he would participate in mutual oral sex. And he actually stated that before you can have sex with a woman, you have to have sex with a man. Like it's this rite of passage that you have to go through. And poor Voorhees, he went through with this and they, he did perform oral sex on Gacy. And over that month, Gacy started to get really cocky and confident when it came to sexually abusing young boys. He actually had forced a young boy to have sex with his own wife so he could then blackmail him into giving him oral sex. Like, where's the blackmail there, though? You forced him into having sex with your wife. What? Gacy also tricked many teens into believing that he was partaking in, like, scientific research. And the scientific research that he was partaking in was apparently homosexual experiments. So these young boys, he was offering them up to $50 each to partake in these homosexual experiments. So in 1968, Donald Voorhees eventually told his dad what Gacy had done to him. And immediately, Donald Voorhees Sr., informed the police, then Gacy was arrested and charged with sodomy and then also the attempted sexual assault of a 16 year old boy called Edward Lynch. Now this idiot, he was he was just trying to do the most and he denied the charges until he was blue in the face and he actually demanded that the police gave him a polygraph test because he was adamant that he's going to pass it because these are all vicious lies that have been made up about him. The results come in they show that he's being deceptive. Now, Gacy tried to play off to the public eye that these allegations were all complete lies and were actually politically motivated. And Voorhees opposed Gacy's nomination for president of the Iowa JCs. Now, the fellow JCs that worked alongside Gacy and also Voorhees Senior, they were just like, I, I don't know, like seeing Gacy through rose tinted goggles because they all believed him. They all believed that Gacy was telling the truth and that Voorhees was lying. And despite all the support that he was receiving from the fellow JCs, Gacy was indicted on charges of sodomy in May of 1968. I believe it was May the 10th to be exact, which that's funny. May the 10th comes up again. You'll see. Now, on August the 30th, Gacy had offered one of his employees, Russell Schroeder, another young boy, $300 if he would assault young Donald Voorhees to basically stop him from testifying against Gacy in court. Now, when this boy Schroeder went to attack Donald Voorhees, Voorhees was actually able to escape. And then he just went right back, told his dad what happened and told the police what had happened as well. And I guess... Gacy thought because he was giving this boy $300 that the boy would basically lie on Gacy's behalf. But when Schroeder got in there, he just 
sung like Johnny Cash and said that, yeah, Gacy made me do this. He promised me $300 to stop Voorhees from testifying against him in court. So this resulted in Gacy being arrested again and he was charged with hiring for assault. So what an idiot, again. Then on September the 12th, Gacy was ordered to undergo a psych evaluation um, and basically the two doctors that had done the psych evaluation both concluded that Gacy had an antisocial personality disorder and they believed that going forward in the future, Gacy would be someone who would cause a lot of problems and only get worse. His problems weren't going to get any better. Also, if you're not aware, because I hadn't actually realised this either, but antisocial personality disorder is a clinical term for sociopathy and psychopathy. They even said that Gacy was very unlikely to benefit from any treatment whatsoever and they did end up concluding that he was competent enough and fit enough to stand trial. So surprisingly on November the 7th 1968, Gacy did end up pleading guilty to the charge of sodomy against Voorhees. However, there was other charges that he was up for against a couple of other youths and he completely denied any involvement in those. Gacy was then convicted of sodomy on December the 3rd and sentenced to 10 years, which he was going to be serving at Animosa State Pen. And the very same day that Gacy was convicted was the exact same day that his wife, Marilyn Myers, had applied for divorce. Within the divorce, Marilyn did state that she wanted full and complete custody of their children. She also wanted the house and wanted to receive alimony. And basically the court ruled in her favour and granted all of these requests. And once the divorce had went through, Gacy never ever seen his wife or his children ever again, which honestly is the best thing for them. Like they're not missing anything with that man. So lucky escape for Marilyn and the children. Now, as it always goes for people like John Wayne Gacy, when he was in prison, he was thought of as the model prisoner. Within a couple of months, he was like the head cook for the prison kitchen kitchen. I was going to say the re restaurant, but prison doesn't have a restaurant. Anyway, he also joined the JCs within prison and he actually got the member count from 50 JC members in prison up to 650, which is kind of crazy. And he was able to do that in, in less than 18 months. Also got the prisoners a pay rise and their daily pay for their work in the mess hall. Also supervised any projects that were happening on the prison ground. He petitioned for better conditions for the prisoner and he basically watched over as they installed a miniature golf course in the prison. I am like, what? Why? Why are these people getting a miniature golf course? Like someone like him? Why is he getting a miniature? Not appropriate. Not appropriate at all. And as always, Gacy wins yet another little reward and Gacy was presented with the Distinguished Service Award for all the work that he had been doing in the prison with his JC involvement. In June of 1969, Gacy was denied parole and was set to prepare for his second parole hearing and then he actually completed 16 high school courses throughout his time in prison and by doing so he was able to obtain his high school diploma which of course he never had before because he dropped out of high school he never finished it then in november of 1969 gacy's dad had died had passed away and when gacy heard this news he fell to the floor he was sobbing and crying and like this hit Gacy really really hard. Gacy had requested supervised compassionate leave but this was also denied so he never got to attend his dad's funeral. Then if we skip forward to June 1970 Gacy was finally granted parole with a 12 month probation period so he couldn't get into any sort of trouble or bother within this period of time or he would have went right back to prison and worth stating he only served 18 months of his 10 year sentence so what's that a year and a half if that yeah, a year and a half. And he did have like some terms and conditions for his parole. So Gacy had a nightly curfew and he was ordered to move back to Chicago, Illinois and live with his mum. And when Gacy was released to prison, he actually swore and promised to one of his friends that he would never ever be back in jail ever again. 
sir, I got news for you. <laughs> You're going back. But yeah, so Gacy really relocated back to Chicago and he did get a job as a short order cook. February 12th, 1971, Gacy is charged with sexual assault. So Gacy had basically picked up this young boy that he seen at a bus terminal and sort of just promised to give him a place for the night, a place where he could rest until his bus was due to come sort of like early hours the next morning. So he lured the boy back to his house and then he tried to force the boy to have sex with him. And Gacy would have been charged and sentenced for this, but unfortunately the boy failed to appear in court. So he was acquitted of any charge. Then on June the 22nd, Gacy was arrested and charged for sexual battery and also reckless conduct when he had basically lured a boy into his car by pretending to be a police officer. Like he had a badge, he had what looked like a gun and ugh, disgustingly when he finally got the boy back into his car, he did force the young boy to perform oral sex on him. Unfortunately, this was another charge that got dropped because apparently the young boy who was forced and sexually assaulted by Gacy, he attempted to blackmail Gacy, so the charges ended up being dropped. Like, how did, like, these, these people have nine lives. I'm not even joking. Like, these people get more chances than anyone. It's insane. Now, somehow, the parole board in Iowa had never ever heard of these charges. So Gacy just got off scot-free and then his parole actually came to an end on the 18th of October, 1971. One month after his parole ended, somehow his Iowa state records were completely sealed. So they weren't accessible. This is a huge problem in this case and I don't, this should never ever have happened because if those records hadn't been sealed when Gacy ended up being a suspect later on like we'll talk about they would have had more information about the kind of guy they were dealing with but no they were sealed. So Gacy was then offered financial assistance from his mum who helped him buy his own house at 8213 West Summerdale Avenue Norwood Park Township and Gacy said this is where he would later go on to commit all of his murders. And from 1974 to 1978, Gacy would host these like big neighbourhood summer parties. And there was like upwards of 400 guests. And the guest list would include like politicians and there'd be really high up business associates that he knew as well. But it's just crazy, like he had all these friends in high places, which I really think worked in his favour this whole time. Then in August in 1971, he got engaged to a woman named Carol Hoff, who was someone Gacy had actually dated back in high school. Like they reconnected, they got talking and decided to give things another go and wound up engaged. Happy love story should end there, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Worth stating as well that Carol had already had two daughters, so her and both of her daughters moved into Gacy's house in July of 1972. Now, I would not for the life of me want a child under his roof. Absolutely not. Then in 1975, Gacy had told his then wife, Carol Hoff, that he was actually bisexual and they had sex one Mother's Day and Gacy had basically said to her that that was the only reason that he had had sex with her was because it was Mother's Day. But he did go on to say that he would never, ever have sex with her again. Now, after that, most evenings for Gacy was spent away from his home and he would come back really early in the morning, like during the night, throughout the early morning. He would always just say that he was working late or he had like a business meeting to attend and that's why he got back so late. But this was not the case. Carol Hoff had actually spotted a number of teenage young boys who were coming and going through the garage where Gacy would like to bring the boys. And then one day when Carol Hoff is like looking through the house, I don't know if she was tidying or if she was actually hoping to find something, but she found like loads of gay porn. And she also found like a bunch of wallets that had the IDs of loads of different young boys in them. And I couldn't confirm, but I'm going to assume that most of them would have been Gacy's victims. Then in October of 1975, Gacy and Carol had like a big, big argument. And this argument led to 
Carol basically saying that she wants a divorce, she wants to break up. Macy agreed to the divorce on the grounds that Carol would continue to live with Gacy until the February of 1976 and then at the very beginning of March Gacy then went ahead granted the divorce on the grounds of infidelity. Now if we go back to 1971 Gacy had established his own construction business called PDM Contractors and this business will wind up being very successful. They did start off doing like minor repairs and then they went on to doing some interior decorating and then it built up to the point that he was doing the remodeling for like drug stores and stuff like that or just any general stores that wanted remodeling done. He was kind of the go-to guy which again gave him more credibility within his neighbourhood, within his town. In March of 1977, Gacy had become a supervisor for PE Systems and this was a firm that specialised in remodelling drugstores. By 1978, PDM contractor revenue was upwards of 200,000. Like, this is what I mean. The guy has a business head on him. But why is it that these people end up being so evil? So Gacy then went on to join the Jolly Joker Clown Club. This club is basically a bunch of people who would dress up as clowns. They would perform at parties, parades. They used to entertain in the children's hospitals and they would perform for like fundraisers and stuff. Now, let me tell you, John Wayne Gacy, creepy ass clown, I would much rather have Art the Clown from Terrifier at one of my birthday parties than I would John Wayne Gacy. He was terrifying. But he basically created two clown characters. So he had Patches and Pogo. And he said that Pogo was like his happy clown and then Patches was his more like serious clown. Now going back to Gacy's company, he did have mostly teen boys or very young men working for him and it was quite often that Gacy would proposition some of his staff for sex. In 1973 Gacy and one of his employees had travelled to Florida and Gacy had said that this was to view a property that he had just bought over there. Now, whilst they were away in Florida together Gacy did actually brutally rape this boy and once they were home the boy obviously was at home and then was thinking about what Gacy had done to him. So he stormed over to Gacy's house and beat him to a pulp in his front garden. Like, thank you, Lord. This, I mean, he should have just kept beating him until he died because this man just needed to be stopped. But when his wife at the time had asked what it was all about, Gacy basically made out that the boy that was working for him done really poor paint work so Gacy was refusing to pay him and then this was a boy's way of getting back at Gacy, beating him up. In May 1975, Gacy had hired another young teen boy named Anthony Antonucci. Two months later, Gacy goes over to the home of this boy, Anthony Antonucci, and he knew at this point that the boy had really injured his foot. I think it was maybe like a sport injury or something. So at this point, they were drinking wine. Gacy, again, is watching a porn movie with this young teen boy. Like, it just, I don't know why you would watch porn. To, it just blows my mind, to be honest. But when he thought that Anthony was quite tipsy, a bit drunk, he then wrestled the young boy to the floor and like cuffed his hands behind his back. But what Gacy didn't realise when he walked away from Anthony was one of the cuffs were actually loose. So Anthony was able to get his hand out of that cuff and then use his other hand to free himself. So what he did is when Gacy came back through, he attacked Gacy and then cuffed Gacy. Gacy begged and pleaded with him to uncuff him, that he never meant it and to please let him go. Gacy hadn't realised that this boy was a high school wrestler and from what I gathered he was very good at it so he kind of was able to overpower Gacy who was a big man like this man was big he was overweight and he was tall he was strong and unfortunately this boy did let Gacy go. Also in 1975 Gacy was appointed the director of Chicago's annual Polish Constitution Day Parade. That was like a tongue twister I'm not gonna lie. Now through this work that he done up until 1978 Gacy's actually photographed with the first lady. 
Rosalind Carter and apparently you could see that he was wearing like an S pin on you know whatever I think it was his jacket or something I'll have a photo anyway um, but it had an S pin which had basically meant that Gacy had special clearance at this event like this is this is the power that's kind of being given to this guy right it's insane and obviously when everything had happened with Gacy this event was deemed an embarrassment to the US Secret Service. Now throughout his time of brutally murdering Gacy had murdered at least 33 young boys 26 of which was found in the crawl space in his house or placed throughout his house. Some were people that he knew Others were young boys that he had picked up at the Greyhound bus station in Chicago or others were males that he propositioned for sex saying that he would give them money and others were actually young boys that Gacy had promised a job or staff that worked for Gacy. There was also some victims that were lured because Gacy had said that he was a police officer. He had like one of those flashing lights that you could put on your car like that looked like the police flashing lights. Um, he had a sheriff's badge as well. He had like a makeshift gun. It's said that Gacy would usually kill one victim at a time, but he did have a few nights that he would refer to as his double nights where he would kill two boys. So Gacy's sort of mode for killing would be once he's got the victim back in his house, it would be to ply them with drink or drugs if they were willing to take them. He would then use his clown tricks to restrain the boy so a lot of the time it was the handcuff trick that he would show them he would basically do the handcuff trick on himself so he'd put his hands behind his back with the cuffs on however he would always hide the fact that he had the key in his hand so he was able to set himself free but obviously it looked like a trick because no one else knew that he had the key and when he would do this in young boys when they had their hands behind their back cuffed and they couldn't get out Gacy would basically be like well yeah that's because you don't have the key and then this is when the terror would really kick in because the boys realise that, you know, they're not going to get free. And then he would brutally rape and brutally torture these poor, poor young boys. And it's said that at some points he would actually straddle their chest, so sitting here on them, and then force the young boys to fillet him. Um, which it's just so horrible. Like the the level of fear that these young boys must have had is just unfathomable Ugh. and you know he would burn the boys with cigars and then he would also turn them into like human horses so he would have them on all fours and then he would sit on their back and basically ride them about like a horse and he would have like these makeshift reins around their necks which obviously was just pulling tighter and tighter to make them go faster basically he would also insert foreign objects into the boys. Um, he had an 18 inch dildo that he would use on these poor boys and would laugh whilst using it and just say the most obscene things to them whilst doing it. <sighs> Another thing that Gacy really enjoyed to do to his victims was actually to partially drown them in his bathtub so he would drown them to the point that they've blacked out like they're almost dying and then he would actually perform CPR on these young boys and revive them to then do it all again like this cycle the torture the rape blah, in the bathtub drown revive it's just, I, like how do these people exist how are these people made I, I don't get it now the way that Gacy would sort of end these boys suffering you know the final act of his murder he would do what he called the rope trick and it's basically a rope tourniquet and what he would do is he would wind this tourniquet on a hammer handle tighter and tighter and tighter until it was like choking the boys to death basically um, he would also take socks and stuff them right at the back of their throat so they would, would be asphyxiated, you know, they, they couldn't breathe at all and he would do the rope trick to them and he always referred to his rope trick as his final trick that he would perform. Gacy said that some of his victims would lie on the floor convulsing for like an hour or two whilst he would just, you know, go about his daily activities. He would just leave them there to die in pain. 
Gacy usually killed between 3am and 6am and then he would store the bodies of the young boys under his bed for 24 hours before then burying them in the crawl space underneath his house. It's also said that he would even embalm some of the bodies before burying them because obviously he'd done the embalming at Pam Mortuary so sometimes he would take them through to his garage and then do embalming there. Gacy's first known murder had taken place in 1972 and it was the murder of a young 16 year old boy called Timothy McCall. Gacy was able to lure young Timothy to his house for sex and to give him a bed for the night. Gacy actually said that they had a really nice night together, they were drinking wine, had some food, um, they just generally chatted. Gacy had went to his bed and then Timothy had slept either in bed with him or in a spare room but I imagine if they've had sex it might have been in Gacy's bed. Then in the morning Gacy gets woken up by Timothy who's standing in the, the door frame of Gacy's bedroom and he's holding a knife in his hand so Gacy immediately goes on the defence, thinks that this young boy is going to try and kill him so before Timothy can do anything, Gacy gets up to attack him. So this poor boy then kind of puts his hands up to surrender, like as in like, you know, I'm not going to hurt you. As he does this, he does accidentally cut Gacy on the arm, which Gacy just takes as another sign that Timothy was going to murder him. Gacy was able to wrestle the knife off of Timothy and then he actually stabbed him to death on the floor of his bedroom and Gacy did say that this was like the ultimate sexual gratification. This is when he knew that murdering gave him this sexual thrill and apparently when Timothy had sadly passed, Gacy had experienced this mind-numbing orgasm like never before. Afterwards, Gacy went to the kitchen where he seen that there was bacon and eggs and just breakfast food lying out. Timothy had actually been cooking him breakfast that morning which is why he had the knife in his hand. I don't know if he was going to ask Gacy like what he wanted or you know tell him breakfast is being made, like telling him to get up basically but Gacy just took this as the opportunity to murder poor Timothy. Another known victim of Gacy's was actually a PDM employee. He was 18 years old, his name was John Butkovich. Gacy said that he had lured John to his house to discuss overdue pay which of course young John never thought anything of. So Gacy had given him alcohol. He had then tricked John into doing the handcuff trick and then proceeded to strangle him. And what is so infuriating about this is John Buckovich's parents were so, so, so suspicious of Gacy. They believed that Gacy had done something to him, but all the police just kept deeming all these young men as runaways. And it's just not the case. John Butkovich's parents phoned the police over 100 times to say that they were so suspicious of John Wayne Gacy and not a single time were they taken serious. In the mid 70s, there was also two other young boys that came forward and said that Gacy had raped them. Um, Gacy was then questioned in relation to other disappearances that had taken place in the area. And during this time is what Gacy would refer to as his cruising years, where he would go and pick up these young boys, rape them, torture them, murder them. And he did say that this was one of the best times in his life. Now, a young boy employed by Gacy had actually told his family that Gacy had made him go into the crawl space underneath the house and dig trenches. Gacy would always play this off and say it was for like drainage pipes, etc. But he did later admit that this was actually graves being dug for his victims that he would bury on his property. When a young boy, Godzik, went missing, Godzik's parents contacted Gacy to ask where he had last seen him or heard from him and Gacy had stated to his family that Godzik had confided in him and said that he was planning on running away but Gacy obviously wanted to keep a secret for him. Now, there was a victim by the name of Robert Donnelly that Gacy actually let go, like left him alive. He had picked up this young boy at the bus terminal in Chicago, had took him home, raped him brutally, brutally tortured him, would perform fake executions with like blank bullets. He would, you know, submerge him in the bathtub, partially drown him, revive him, his usual stuff. And it got so bad to the point where this boy was in so much agonising pain, he begged John Wayne Gacy to just kill him. But when he done that, 
John Wayne Gacy decided to let him go. And I can't help but think, is this like the sadistic, like getting the enjoyment of the fact that this boy's probably never going to recover from what Gacy's done to him? So he's going to let him go to live through that every single day. Now, what's even worse about this is young Robert Donnelly reported this to the police, right? He told them exactly what happened, what Gacy had done to him and what Gacy most likely planned on doing with him, murdering him. And when Gacy was questioned about this, he was like, oh, no, 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 like, that's that's not right. Like, it was consensual sex slavery that we were participating in. And the police at this point were just anything that was like, of a homosexual nature, anything that involved gay men, they want nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. So no charges came about for this either. One month after this very attack, Gacy would then go on and kill another young boy. By 1978, Gacy no longer had any more room in his, the crawl space under his house for any further victims' bodies. So he actually started throwing them into the Des Plaines River, which is off of Interstate 55, I believe. It's like off a bridge. So he just started putting the victims in the Des Plaines River. Now, I always think that this particular awful murder is probably the pivotal point in this case. And this is the murder of young Robert Peast. So on December the 11th, 1978, young Robert Peast was working at the drugstore that he worked with. It was sometime around nine o'clock and he had overheard Gacy talking to the store manager about how much he pays the boys who work for him. And I believe it was something like double what Young Peast was being paid at the time by the drugstore. And obviously what young boy doesn't want more money? So he was really interested in possibly having a job with Gacy. Gacy was in the pharmacy this night because he was there to discuss a potential remodeling job with the store manager. Bill stared as when he had noticed Peast and was you know, saying that he might be able to offer him a job somehow. Now, on this night, it was Peace's mother's birthday and she was picking him up from his shift at the drugstore because they had planned that they were going to go home and have like a party to celebrate, obviously. So it was around nine and Peace said to his mum, you know, I just want to meet with, with Gacy. Um, you know, he's potentially going to give me a job. So if you just like wait in the store and then I'll just be a couple of minutes, I'll be right back. So she hangs around waiting for her son. The store closes and her son's still not here. And the store manager says, well, you know, maybe he's went for a drive with Gacy or, you know, maybe he's decided to walk home. And his mum, obviously trying to think the best, was like, I mean, like maybe, but she knew he wouldn't do this. She was there to pick him up. If she'd done this before, he would be right there with her. Like, there's no reason he would walk home. So Gacy had taken Young Peace home with him. He gave him a soft drink and had basically asked Peace, you know, is there anything that you wouldn't do for the right price? And Peace insisted to Gacy, you know, like, no, I'm a, I'm a hard worker. Like, I work really hard. And then Gacy had said to Peace that good money could be earned through hustling, which I believe is almost like prostitution or like, you know, being paid for sex. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sorry if I am. Again, Gacy goes ahead and he wants to perform the handcuff trick for Peast. Peast is really dismissive. He's like, no, I need to get back. Like, it's my mum's birthday. Like, I really should go. And Gacy forces him into these handcuffs. Gacy tried to state that Peast did not resist whilst Gacy removed his trousers, which I do not believe for a second because I'm pretty sure this boy was absolutely terrified of this giant man. Gacy also said that when he placed the rope for the rope trick around young Peace's neck that he was crying and sobbing. And sadly, of course, Gacy done his usual, the rape, the torture, everything brutal that you could possibly think of and more was done to Robert Peace, to all the other young boys. They had the worst fate imaginable. Also said that as Peace lay dying on Gacy's floor, Gacy took a business phone call whilst Peace is lying, gurgling and splattering and spluttering because he's dying. And he was so, so scared. Gacy said that, said how terrified this boy was, but he enjoyed it. So the Peace family, when they 
you know, kind of realise, like, yeah, do you know what, he must be missing. They reported Robert missing to the Des Plaines police and the store manager had said that, you know, Gacy was talking to this young boy about a job. So they're thinking in their minds, like, right, let's speak to Gacy, see what he knows and we'll go from there. So now we're going to talk about Lieutenant Joseph Kozensack. He was the chief at this point. He only had been for six months and a lot of people did state when he took on this case, like he only did it because he had a lot to prove. Everybody else that had dealt with, you know, these young boys before were just concluding that they were runaways, that they might come home or that they've moved away, were given no closure to the family. But with Detective Kozensack, his son attended the same high school as Robert Peast and he knew of Robert Peast and knew that he was not the kind of boy to just run away and I think the fact that he had a son just really hit home for him that you know a son Robert Peast's age you know he could fall victim to this as well and he just was not convinced that this was a runaway and he decided to take the case on and that he would do whatever it took to find who was doing this to these boys. I forget that I'm not tan so I'm just gonna bronze up my face and my neck to match. So anyway, Lieutenant Kozenzak, he decides that he's gonna look into John Wayne Gacy's background, see what he can find and he was able to see the sodomy charge against the 15 year old boy that led to his imprisonment in Iowa and also the sexual battery charge that Gacy had as well. The other people just hadn't looked for. It's crazy to me. So Kozenzak and two other officers decide that they're going to pay Gacy a visit so they go out to his house that night and Gacy point blank states that he never spoke to Robert Peast. When he went back to the drugstore it was only because he had received a call from Torf, the drugstore manager, that he had left his appointment book in the pharmacy or well, the drugstore. They actually asked Torf about this who says that there was no phone call to Gacy. He never asked Gacy to come back to the store for his appointment book. So quite clearly, he's just went to meet up with this young boy. So Gacy actually agreed that he would go to the, the station, that he would do a statement, but he was really busy just now. So they were going to have to wait. It was just going to have to be later on. And Kozenzak said to him, well, you know, how quick are you going to be able to come down? And Gacy then stated to them, like, you know, you guys are so rude that you have no respect for the dead. Because apparently Gacy had a family member that had just passed away. So he was saying that that's why he couldn't come down right now. So it was around 3.20am when Gacy had arrived at the station. And he was, like, covered in mud and dirt. But he just stated to, you know, the the detectives, the police there, that he had been in a car accident on his way down. So of course Gacy is denying, denying, denying that he had any involvement in the disappearance of Robert Peast, said that he didn't even talk to the boy, he was still adamant about his appointment book story that Torf had called him down to get it, but Torf had given a statement already that no he didn't. So Gacy then agrees to do a written statement for the police. On December the 13th, they had obtained a search warrant for Gacy's home and when they had went in there, they found a lot of dodgy stuff that, you know, the normal person just wouldn't have. Like, they, he had hypodermic needles, there was loads of gay porn, there was the handcuffs, there was boxer shorts that were just far too small to fit Gacy and his large ass. They also found the fake sheriff badge along with a starter pistol. There was also a book on homosexuality. There was also capsules of amyl nitrate and oh, I'm sorry to say it but there was like dildos everywhere. There was also a two by four with holes in each end. There was bottles of Valium and Atrophine. There was driver's licenses and a blue parka. This parka is going to be very 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 important so please Blue parka, remember that. They also found like a high school class ring with the initials J-A-S engraved on it as well. And there was also a receipt from the Nissan pharmacy, the one that Robert Peast worked at, in the trash bin in Gacy's house, along with a 36 inch of nylon rope. Des Plaines police also went on to confiscate 
Gacy's car along with any other like work motors that he was using as well and then there was a surveillance team set up to monitor Gacy at all times. On December the 15th from the sealed records that they had been able to bring up about the battery charge obviously with them being sealed they had to go to that police station directly and ask for the full report. So they were able to learn that Jeffrey Rignall, the victim of Gacy, said that Gacy lured him into his car, raped, tortured him, chloroformed him as well, and then had dumped him in Lincoln Park. The same day that this all took place, they were also able to track the ring with the initials JAS back to a John Allen Sizzik. On December the 16th, Gacy proceeded to say that the police were harassing him and that this was all politically motivated like not everything's politics john believe it or not like we don't we don't we don't care that you think you're all political we don't care it's not why we're here but he was convinced that they were harassing him because of political connections or his recreational drug use so i think he smoked weed quite a lot um but that's yeah that's not uh, that's like a, what, a fly in the ointment for what you've actually done. Gacy also took it upon himself to flout traffic laws because he knew that the police wouldn't arrest him for something so stupid. Well, in his mind, stupid, but they actually wouldn't arrest him for that because that's not what they need him for. So on December the 17th, a search was conducted of Gacy's car and also his work van. So they had brought in these trained search dogs to have a look around the car see if they could pick anything up and in the boot of Gacy's car the dogs did do the death reaction meaning that there would have been a dead body in the back of his car. So on December the 18th Gacy's played in this role of like trying to befriend the Des Plains police so the investigator slash surveillance that were on him he invites him out for breakfast and he's talking about like marriage, business, clowning and then just throws in don't you know that clowns can get away with murder? So casually and cold like he knew that they knew but he knew that they didn't know enough at this point to take him in on anything. He thought he was so clever and so slick, it's so annoying. So it was also on the same day of December the 18th that Gacy was wandering around looking very distressed, dishevelled, tired. He was drinking all the time at this point so he was drunk as a skunk and he was also incredibly anxious as well and he drove to his lawyers where he was planning on basically putting a harassment suit onto the Des Plaines police, I think for like £750,000. He was willing to go to court and take them there for harassment. Like, you are literally a murderer. What? The brass neck of this man to take the police to court for harassment when he knows what he's done? So on this very same day, the Des Plaines police were able to track this Nissan pharmacy receipt back to Kimberly Byers. Now Kimberly Byers was a colleague who worked alongside Robert Peast and she had said that night it was really cold so Robert had given her his blue parka, his blue parka and she was ringing something up and when he was going out of the store to talk with Gacy, she was like, oh, you're going to need your coat. So she just very quickly put the receipt in the pocket before giving Robert his blue parka back for him to go. So now it's December the 19th and the civil suit against Des Plains Police is scheduled for December the 22nd. You see, it ends up inviting their surveillance team into his home, right? He's always doing this. One of the surveillance officers kind of has Gacy distracted and the other one says that he really needs to go to the toilet so he makes his way through to the toilet but really what he was going to do is go to a TV in Gacy's bedroom because he was trying to get a serial number off of it because John Allen Sizzik's family had actually confirmed that his TV had went missing when he went missing so they believe that this could have been Sizzik's TV that is in John Wayne Gacy's room so they've taken the serial number to try and trace it back. So when he goes into the bathroom, because obviously you've got to play the part, like do the flush of the toilet and stuff. So he goes into the bathroom and he flushes the toilet and through the heat induct comes the smell of death. If you ever listen to an interview with like officers or speak to an officer, the smell of death is something that cannot be mistaken for anything else. It is the worst smell ever. So December 20th comes around and Gacy is driving again to his lawyer's office, I'm assuming to discuss 
the civil case that he's doing against Des Plaines Place. However, when he gets there, all dishevelled, anxious, agitated, tired, drunk looking, his lawyer has some doubts setting in about Gacy's story and Gacy's innocence in this. So his lawyer lays down a newspaper article in front of him and says, you said you had something important to tell me, so tell me. And he's pointing to the article about Robert Peace going missing. Gacy then proceeds to pick up the newspaper, looks at the article about Peace and said, this boy's dead, he's dead, he's in the river. So he's admitted to his lawyer that he's killed this young boy. Gacy then proceeds to give this rambling, jumbled confession to his own lawyer, stating that he was a judge, jury and executioner of many of their lives. He said that he's killed at least 30 boys. He said around 25 of them had been buried in the crawl space in his house. He said that another five had been thrown into the Des Plaines River. But ultimately, he admitted that he was the man who was killing these young innocent boys in the most brutal way. Gacy was referring to these young boys as prostitutes, hustlers, liars, saying that all they wanted was money from him and they were trying to expose him. Gacy said that sometimes he would go to sleep and when he'd wake up, he'd just see a boy lying on his floor with handcuffs behind his back. Like, was he, like, is he trying to make out that he was blacking out whilst he was doing this? Like, I have no re like recollection. I, that You know, it wasn't me. So Gacy was drunk during this confession, so he ends up falling asleep whilst doing the confession. And his lawyer had ordered a psych evaluation for him. When Gacy wakes up, he says, no, I've, I'm too busy. I've got things to do. I don't have time for a psych evaluation. And he took off. At this point, Gacy knows his time's coming. His time is nearly up. So he drives to a gas station where he gives weed to one of the attendants and basically says, the end is coming for me. These guys are going to kill me, referring to surveillance and police. Gacy then drove to one of his friend's houses. His name was Ronald Road and burst into tears. And he was basically saying, I've been a bad, bad boy. I've killed 30 people, give or take. Then he went to colleagues Rossi and Cram and he also gave them this confession. He confessed that he had been the one killing these young boys. Although, did they already know? I don't know. So then he asked Cram to drive him to Maryhill Cemetery, which is where his father was buried. And when this comes through on the police radio, the police are thinking, this guy's going to commit suicide. This guy's going to kill himself before we can get him. So we need to pick him up. We need to arrest him now. So they proceed to arrest Gacy. Then on the 21st of December, around 4.30pm, they're actually granted a second search warrant. So they go back to Gacy's property. So from what I could see, Gacy had like pulled the plug on something, which meant that the, the crawl space had flooded. So the examiners and things, they had to basically drain the crawl space before they could go down and examine if there were any bodies there. Once it was drained, evidence tech Daniel Gente shouted up to the investigators and said, you can go ahead and charge him with murder right now. He then continued and said, I think this place is full of kids. On December 22nd, John Wayne Gacy confessed to killing approximately 30 young boys. Gacy also confessed to peace murder as well and actually stated that he slept with peace body beside him that night, like cuddling into him. Gacy also confirmed that he picked up Peace around, you know, just after nine at night and Peace was dead shortly after 10. It's almost like he was getting reckless, like things had to be more rushed because he knew that people were starting to think things about him. And then they had taken Gacy to the bridge off Interstate 55 to show them exactly where the bodies of the other boys had been thrown in. Gacy then went on to draw a diagram of the crawl space depicting where the 26 bodies of the young boys were. And he had also confirmed that there was three elsewhere throughout the property, I think like under the floorboards. I think there was one under the floorboards in the recreational room and I believe there was one under his garage as well. Casey was then brought to trial on the 6th of February 1980 and he was charged with 33 murders of young men. And Gacy goes on and tries to claim that he had a multiple personality disorder. 
So he had four different characters that would take over his body and he wouldn't know what he was doing. So he said that he had, you know, himself, like the hardworking contractor, businessman, upstanding citizen, then said that he had a policeman. And this policeman was called Jack Hanley or he was referred to as Bad Jack. So this was like the guy that was picking up the kids. He then had his clown personality and then also the active politician personality. Like um, this is giving me Split. Do you know that movie Split? It's like Gacy's went up in court and he's like, it's not me, it's Patricia. That's how it feels. So Gacy's lawyers said to him, you know, plead not guilty for reason of insanity. And let's just hope that sticks. Let's just hope that the jury think that you're insane. Other victims of Gacy's came forward to testify. So we had Jeffrey Rignall, Donald Voorhees and also Robert Donnelly. So they actually testified on March the 12th. The jury had deliberated for one hour and 50 minutes. Gacy was found guilty of the 33 murders along with sexual assault, sexual battery and taking indecent liberties of children. Then the jury had deliberated for more than two hours regarding the sentencing of Gacy and they went ahead and they said that they wanted him executed, you know, he was getting the death penalty and his execution date was then set for June the 2nd, 1980. So he ended up remaining on death row for 14 years. He painted clowns, birds, skulls, he painted his home and John Dillinger. Is some of his paintings were actually sold and others are in art exhibitions. Like, wh why are we honouring? the devil. I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Gacy filed pff, a ton of motions to try and get his sentence appealed as they do. I'm not even like getting into all this stuff. Like there's a lot that happens whilst Gacy was in prison, but I've got to be honest, I, j I don't care about what the man went through in prison, right? I just want to get to the part where he's executed. So he was doing all these appeals and then in 1984, the Supreme Court of Illinois upheld the conviction. They were like, nah, you know, you're you're gone. They then ordered his execution for November the 14th by lethal injection. When I was younger, I used to always think he got the chair for some reason, but obviously it was a lethal injection. So for Gacy's final meal, he had like a, a little 360 and he went for KFC. So he had like buckets of chicken. He also had strawberries and also a Diet Coke. Before the execution of John Wayne Gacy, thousands had gathered. Then on May the 10th, 1994, John Wayne Gacy was pronounced dead at 12.58am. Weirdly, his brain was removed for scientific research and there is actually a TV show that I watched years ago and I think it was like this woman who has his brain was testing it for science. Um, I think she was like doing a comparison, like trying to see the, what the brain of a psychopath is like. Um, if I can find it, I'll link it below because it was actually really interesting. But yeah, they did use his brain for scientific research. They do say that his last words were, kiss my ass, but his lawyer says that's not true. So I don't really know what his last words were. I think basically he had said it to police at some point, like kiss my ass, but they weren't his final words. John Wayne Gacy's home was demolished in April of 1979. The Tribune reported at the time that it was a relief to neighbours, including one who told the newspaper, I'll be glad when every bit of it is gone. Gacy said that he buried 27 victims on his property, but 29 would be discovered, most of them in the crawl space. Four other bodies would be found by the police, including that of Robert Peast. These had been thrown into rivers south of Chicago. Not all of Gacy's victims have been identified. The last body identified was in October 2021 and we can only hope that in the future the rest can be identified. But that is it for the case of John Wayne Gacy. I know it was a hard one, it was a long one. Oops. Um, but I know it was longer than what they usually are so I really hope it's been somewhat interesting to you. Obviously all these young boys sadly died and there is some that remain unidentified to this day which is really hard to know but please leave any case suggestions that you have down below. I will also leave down below all the products that I've used in my face. They'll all be linked in case you want to purchase any. Any case suggestions can be sent over to my email if you'd rather not comment so I'll have that up on the screen now for you. It would mean the world to me if you give my Instagram and TikTok a follow but ultimately 
I would just love if you could subscribe on my channel. I really hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!